first of all, I want to say distinguished guests, panelists, speakers, everybody involved. First of all, thank you for, for picking Ireland and thank you for spending your time to come visit us. We are excited, Kingsley and I, to be co-chairing or co-facilitating this discussion. But before we begin, I think it would be remiss of us not to thank everybody involved, particularly the co-chairs of the IOM and the Government of Ireland, including Marina, Larissa and all the team who put this together. And of course, everybody behind the scenes that helps us put this event together. As you may have guessed already, I have a strong Irish accent, so I apologize in advance to the interpreters. But when I hand over to Kingsley, you would actually be surprised that we're from the same country. <laughs> so what we're going to talk about today for a couple of minutes is just to get a sense of what happened on day one of the summit. Because obviously this is the second day and the in-person component of the summit. And what's exciting for us in many ways is to, to think about it. When we think about where we were 10 years ago, and I think if you look across the range of interventions this morning, it's quite clear that the road ahead is exciting, but there's also some really important global collaboration challenges ahead. So we have to think about that at a policy level, at a programmatic level, and also in terms of the partnerships that we need to move forward. But one of the things I would say and what was struck to me very early on on Friday was a very powerful line, and I think it encapsulates what we've heard about this morning from the range of governmental interventions, is that diasporas are part of the connective tissue of humanity. And I think if we think about where we are in the world today and finding issues that find genuine global collaboration when we just look at the numbers, and we've heard them all this morning, but when we think about the definitional inclusion of diaspora as next generation and multi-generational, multi that 281, 282 million actually becomes multiplied. And what's really fascinating, I think, is that it's a human experience that has touched every country, probably every city, and most families around the world. So there's something inherently powerful about what we're talking about this morning and about where we can go moving forward. So, just to get it going, one of the greatest compliments I was ever given was that I was called Kingsley Jr. And Kingsley sitting across the table from me. And you know, in life you have to be lucky enough to have people around you to help you on the journey. So what we heard about on the first day was across six different sessions and four technical working groups from a range of conversations and topics ranging from humanitarianism to data to culture, to economic capital, human capital, social capital. So what Kingsley and I tried to do was to put together just some key takeaways that we think encapsulate those. But you know, at my heart, I'm, I'm a bit of a boring academic. I get to write the walk. Kingsley has very much walked the walk in terms of his career and having lived in, I think, six countries, Kingsley, over, the, over your life cycle, and particularly working in diaspora philanthropy. So I want to maybe just hand over to you, Kingsley, because I know you were involved in that session to kind of give us a sense of, for you from day one, you know, for everybody that maybe didn't have the chance to dial in or just wanted to reflect about how this should get reflected in the outcome document, for you, what were the key takeaways and where should we be looking in terms of where we bring the sector forward? Well, thank you, Martin. I, I can take off the <laughs> headphones now. Um, you know, it was a day of energy in the three E's, energy, enthusiasm, and empathy. It was really an outstanding day of contribution from lots and lots of people. You know, we covered a lot of territory, uh, and one of the early sessions I was involved in was um, diaspora philanthropy. And I think that's really interesting. It was defined as, uh, on your papers as time, treasure, and talent. Some people talk about it as private wealth for public good, um, sometimes described as the kindness of strangers. The one I like is planting trees under whose shade you will not sit. I think that's really nice. Deep historical and uh, religious roots, in fact. But the exciting thing for diasporas is that we're going to be entering into now, you know, a really extraordinary period of sustained growth in, in philanthropy in general, but also in diaspora philanthropy. You know, we sometimes say life is about going from struggle to success and from success to significance. And that's the period people begin to think a bit more about things like heritage and ancestry and affinity, all those sorts of things. Because what we're seeing now is an extraordinary accumulation of wealth in the Western world, particularly um, people aged 60 and over. And this has been driven by the phenomenon we're entering now is the intergenerational transfer of wealth. The greatest cache of wealth in the history of mankind now in the hands of these people who have to make a choice. What do they want to do with this wealth? And there's only, there's only three things you can do with this wealth. You can give it to your children, and that's going to happen. Uh, if you are a member, as Warren Buffett said, if you're a member of the Lucky Sperm Club, if you just so happen that you're, 
your family are very wealthy, you're going to inherit wealth. The second thing is you can actually pay the money to the government in taxes, but the third thing is you can give it away. And that's why we're seeing an explosion, the early days of an explosion of um, diaspora philanthropy. Accenture wrote a report that was called the Intergenerational Transfer of Wealth. You can read you read it online, it's called the Greater Wealth Transfer, and said that just in the US alone, over the next 25 years, $30 trillion would be transferred intergenerationally. And so the exciting thing about this is that if you position yourself correctly, members of your diaspora are going to be in this very elite club in many ways. And what's happening now is that structures are being developed uh, around the world, in the US, the UK, Australia, other countries, to allow for the very tax efficient giving of this money away and much of this money has been going and can go to projects overseas. And we've had the emergence of what they call donor advised funds. There's over a million of these funds in the United States. There's $180 billion in these funds. They gave away $37 billion last year. So I think that was you know, really one of the exciting things. And in many ways, Martin, a model exists for diaspora philanthropy. And the model is the university alumni model. And that's all about getting small contributions from a large number of people, and then a very large contribution from a very small number of the people. And it's that kind of 90-10 rule we know from business, etc. So I think that was one of the most interesting things that came out of the first day. And, and Kingsley, can, can I ask you a question? Because for me, kind of dialing across, because the sessions ran parallel to each other, so we kind of divided and yeah. participated. What was, what was really interesting to me was that no matter some of the subject topics that we were discussing in the sessions, certain themes did emerge. And one of those, for example, was around the role of government and how can government, we've heard it already this morning, how does government create those enabling environments? You know, and one of the things that came out quite strongly for me was, you know, particularly in the technical working groups, was how do, we, how do we get governments maybe talking to each other more regularly and more often? And I think that can be a key outcome of the summit. But also, you know, how do we work through building the right type of institutions for diaspora engagement, the right type of policies? And, and particularly, I think what was important and really amplified through a lot of the sessions was obviously the role of diplomatic missions and embassies and consulates. So I'd love to maybe just quickly unpack that to get a sense of, you know, when we think about what does this look like at a policy level and an institutional level and some of your reflections of the conversations in that sense. Yeah, like I think there's two elements in your question there. One is, you know, what's the role of government to diaspora engagement? Should they be... Uh, implementers of these programs and policies, or should they be facilitators? Um, we in Ireland tend to come down on, this, on the side of facilitation. The government should be benign um, supporters of what's going on. They don't need to do everything. Governments don't have to do everything, but they need to create the enabling conditions. They, they need to be supportive of the efforts. Um, two weeks ago in, in Washington, um, a private philanthropic organization that I used to work for called the Ireland Funds had a, a major event. Uh, attended by the President of the United States, uh, Joe Biden, attended by Nancy Pelosi, attended by 60 members of Congress, but with the full support of the Irish government. The Irish Taoiseach, our Prime Minister, was a guest speaker, or was meant to be until he got COVID, um, and you had uh, a, an array of, uh, of, of official government supporters there. So it was a neat little joint effort between a private philanthropic organization and the government. That is a good, I think, a good example of this sort of thing in practice. But I think the other question you ask is, you know, what, what is the home within government of diaspora engagement? And it, probably the natural home for it is the Department of Foreign Affairs, um, but with a whole of government engagement and approach. So maybe a, some sort of consultative body that engages all different sides of, of, of government. Um, because you see, Departments of Foreign Affairs, they have a distribution structure globally. They have smart people around the world. They have got funds to engage in programs. They have, what well, I think, excuse your expression, Martin, convening power. You know, an invitation from an ambassador, an invitation from a consul general, carries some clout. So I think that they have that opportunity to, to be in that, they're the only department of government that have that international kind of network that's out there. So my experience is um, a, a benign uh, relationship between the two, which is all about sort of facilitation rather than implementation. And Kingsley, can I quickly kind of reflect as well? I should never say this as an academic, so I apologize in advance. You know, but you're a big believer in diaspora engagement is non-competitive. And we heard that this morning, I think, as well from the colleague from Mauritius, in a sense of what also kind of struck me just across the first day was just the vibrancy 
of the sector, you know, and as somebody that's passionate and spends a lot of the time researching it, it was actually quite inspiring for me not just to hear about the different work of different governments, but to ask for organisations and civil society, and please keep your comments coming in online because we're, we're keeping track of those as well. And what was fascinating for me was that, you know, we have governments at different stages of the engagement process, some beginning, some a little bit more advanced, and, and how do we kind of work that through, you know, and I think for me that's where that, that diaspora diplomacy, not just in terms of governments engaging with their diasporas as a country of origin or, or a residence, or, but diaspora diplomacy is that government to government piece. I think is critically important because, as you say, it's non-competitive. So you have the phrase, copy and steal everything. <laughs> Which, you know, as in academia, it's called plagiarism. We're not allowed to do it. <laughs> so it's, a, it's important to keep, you know, looking at what other governments are doing and how does that push forward and move forward. And I think, coming to that, I think the biggest question we always get, Kingsley, in our work, and it was the very first session, is data. How do we understand who is the diaspora, where are they, and what are they doing? So do you have any reflections in the sense of, you know, just your interpretation of the conversation on Monday of some key reflections in that area also? Well, I think there's two, two questions there. One is, is data, and it's the who are they, where are they, what are they doing? And the brutal reality is most countries don't have that information. They have bits of it, and it's in diff lots of sort of different places. Um, the other challenge is that who owns that data, you know? Who, who has control of it? Who can use it? You know, when, when I was working um, in the US running a diaspora organization, we built up a database of over 100,000 supporters around the world, but we were not willing to share that with other organizations because they would want to use it for their own purposes, so they'd want to use it to, to sell products or whatever it is. So I think that that's, that's an interesting challenge. Um, of course, technology is changing everything. There's 800 million people around the world are on LinkedIn. So at a click of a switch, you can find out. There are ways of digging into big data to find out where your diaspora are. There's a whole subject of onomastics. I think you're familiar with onomastics. is a study of, of the tracking of people by their surnames, and countries have distinctive surnames. Um, so, so I think that we're entering into a period now where there are ways and techniques of finding out, and answering that fundamental question of who are they, where are they, what are they doing, but we still have to deal with the issue as who owns that mat material and information, how can it be used. Thank you, Kingsley. And I think you, you, you said a word that was the topic of another session, and I think it cuts across many different areas, the sense of digital and technology. And I think what we're seeing is, you know, there was a very powerful quote from Samaria. From, from Meta who said, you know, technology is arguably the 21st century sector that's going to transform diaspora engagement, which is quite a powerful concept when you think about it. And I think it, it, it leans into a couple of other considerations that came out across the days for me. And I think one of them was next generation and how they're beginning to connect and convene and coordinate and, and get active in terms of diaspora engagement. And also, I guess, the next logical question, because it links the data as well to a degree of, you know, who are the right type of partnerships that you need around the table, particularly from the perspective of government? Because I think the exciting thing for me, at least if I was sitting in a governmental office, and I don't know if I'll ever be allowed into one <laughs> in many ways, is, you know, when you begin to think of who do we need around the table to help us execute? Because to me, that would mean governments don't have to do it on their own which is quite exciting when you think about it, you know, particularly if you're at the earlier stages of your diaspora engagement journey. So just that sense of digital next generation and partnerships, I think that ties it together. And we maybe might close with some key, key kind of factors for success from day one. Yeah, yeah when, it, when, it, when you talk digital, I think, I think we, we all love our technology. We all realize the, the extraordinary capacity we have to get data. But I'd be a fan of um, diaspora engagement is about being high tech, and high touch, and, and if you ignore the high touch stuff, you're really ignoring what drives people, you know, which is a passion, interest, a sense of belonging, you know, all of those soft thing, elements that people have towards their country of origin or ancestry or affinity. So I think that we got to get the high tech, high touch thing in balance. Um, you know, I completely agree with you about the next generation because they live their lives differently, they connect and communicate differently, so there needs to be approaches and policies and strategies in that area. And one of the things we set up was a young leaders program, uh, which attracted lots of people under the age of 30. And then in terms of your final question, I think was to do with partners, and of course, governments are involved and foundations are involved and you know, non-profits are involved and high net worth individuals are involved and academia is involved, but I think there's one element that we've yet to uh, really score heavily in, and that's the corporate sector, the multinational corporate sector. I don't think they yet see the benefit of this. Some, some sectors like travel or tourism, yes, 
but I, I don't think the technology sector really got into it. I'm not sure the pharma sector have got into it, the biosciences have got into it. So I think there's a job of work to be done there, Martin. Um, in, in fact, you know, I think one of the challenges we have in diaspora is that many people don't understand the word. Um, you know, I was talking to Russell Dagleish, who chaired a wonderful session on Friday from the Scottish Business Network, and he said, you know, four years ago, I'd never heard the word. I didn't know what it meant. He said I thought it meant it's something you take with a headache. So, so, um, so, so I think there's a piece of work to be done there, and then there's that other piece of work, you know, migrants and diaspora, you know, what's the relationship, what's the difference? So there's there's a, some issues there of, of definition. I just maybe then Kingsley to close, because I'm conscious of time and keeping the conversation going. You know, if we really unpack different topics that we talked about, you know, ready, everything from climate to issues of fragility, humanitarian crisis, to networking, to data, you know, if we had to really identify maybe just three key factors for success, and I think with a lens to what we're achieving in the outcome document, in a sense of why now is the perfect time for this outcome document, to really have governments and different actors sitting around the table in a coherent and consistent way to really share their expertise, both good and bad, let's be honest, you know, some things work, some things don't. So just maybe that sense of, because for me, I'll begin, I'll let you off the hook, I'll begin in many ways. You know, for me, one of the things that came across was just the, the incredible depth and range of work from governments in terms of ser services to the diaspora. And, you know, and quite often, because of the linkages to international development, we often think about engaging the successful members of the diaspora, right? That, that's where the natural focus tends to be. But I think we've heard already this morning that it's also about you know, supporting maybe the more vulnerable members of the diaspora, whether that's in terms of as migrants or later generation in terms of diaspora. I think what's incredibly important for me was that issue of institutionalization and really thinking about what does this look like in a policy, and we kind of reflected on that earlier. So, so they were kind of key takeaways from my side. I think we can talk about the programmatic approaches and things like that, but particularly with a view to the outcome document, any key takeaways for you before we kind of go into a more detailed overview of what that process to develop the outcome document was? I think one of the things I was emphasized on Friday is that um, there is no such thing as a, you know, a Spanish diaspora, New Zealand diaspora, Scottish diaspora. There's many. And you do have to segment your market. You do it in all sorts of other businesses, so I don't see why it shouldn't be applied to diasporas. There are many different diasporas, got different needs, different desires, and you have to deal with them separately and differently. That would be the first thing. I think I totally pick up on your point about diaspora strategies and engagement policies have to be about the successful and the vulnerable. You know, you've got to win acceptance in this area. And if you ignore and make this just purely the successful, then it becomes an elite approach and that sows the seeds of its own decline, I think. And I think the other thing that's come out as well last Friday was that diaspora isn't necessarily about a country, but can be about a place. The place could be a region, a town, a village. You know, you and I did some work uh, in Bosnia recently uh, to do with high-tech investment from the diaspora, and they discovered through this project that they didn't necessarily want to go to Sarajevo or the big cities. They wanted to go back to the places where their parents were from or where they were brought up or born. And so that whole notion of diaspora equals place, I think, is fundamental. Perfect. Kingsley, thank, thank you. you for your interventions. And I think people will also rec recognize that Kingsley has forgotten more about diaspora than I know. So I always pick up some interesting pieces from Kingsley as we go. And, but I think what's exciting for me, I used the word earlier about a vibrancy in, a vibrancy in the sector. And I think what's really fascinating from the perspective of governments either as a country of origin or a country of residence, but also across the continuum of engagement to include diasporas, I think if we think about where we were with the first diaspora ministerial forum to where we are today and thinking about where we could potentially be in 10 years' time, I think we're at a, a particularly significant moment in time for diaspora engagement as a sector. And the next question for everybody around the table, I think, and everybody dialing in online and getting involved is to think about how do we put some shape on that? How can we put together a future agenda of action to help us really think through what we're trying to achieve in this? So the Director General this morning mentioned that you know, we're working towards the outcome document, but it, it's not a new document. It has been a phased and iterative process based across many different con regional consultations and many meetings with technical staff that I see sitting behind me and sitting across the room. So thank you for your participation and your energy in that. And I think what would be helpful now would to re really have a think, just a very quick intervention from the IOM, just to give us a sense of what that looked like in action and a sense of the process to get us to where we are today before then we open the floor for, for considerations on the document and get to lunch. <laughs> Roberto, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, I'll try to be brief, because I know that uh, everybody's hungry. Um, 
but as Mern mentioned, uh, with I, within IOM, we uh, supported uh, a series of regional consultations um, in preparation for this event to be able to garner uh, inputs and insights for the outcome document, uh, which we'll be looking at shortly. Uh, these regional consultations were held uh, virtually, um, and they were structured around working groups that looked at the four different capitals uh, which we've been discussing uh, on Friday, so economic, social, cultural, and human capital. So within each consultation, we had working groups around these four issues. The consultation in the Americas was part of a two-day workshop that was organized within the framework of the South American Conference for Migration. On the second day, the 17th of March, uh, was focused on the preparations for this global uh, diaspora summit and counted with the participation of the Regional Conference for Migration, which covers Central America, North America, and the Dominican Republic. We had over 50 participants um, providing inputs into that session. Um, then we had a regional consultation for Eurasia and the Pacific on the 22nd of March, again virtual, and that one counted uh, with participation not only of government uh, officials and representatives, but also uh, diaspora organizations. Uh, we had representation uh, of over 100 participants from Australia to Austria and everywhere in between. Um, and finally, we had a Pan-African consultation that took place last week on the 30th of March. It was done in cooperation with the African Union, so very pleased to have your support and have your participation here today. And with that consultation, not only did we have governments and diaspora organizations, but also UN agencies um, and other partners like the African Development Bank. Um, so the, these were the main uh, consultations. Uh, many of the themes that came out we saw happen, coming up today and on Friday. Um, so I'll just touch on these very briefly. On, in terms of policy, data, having better data to understand the different groups within diaspora since they're recognized that they're not a homogenous group and also knowing more about their contributions. The importance of facilitating political participation, especially through streamlining processes, was also highlighted throughout the three uh, consultations. And ensuring uh, implementation and monitoring of policies, so not only having them on writing, but making sure that they actually work uh, on the ground. In terms of programmatic uh, points, the challenge of resource mobilization was a recurrent theme, which we all recognize. Um, and supporting the capacity building of diaspora organizations as mentioned across the three consultations. Empowering diplomatic missions uh, to have a more active role in disseminating information, communication with diaspora, but also supporting diaspora organizations and communities through coordination with other local actors. Um, and as been mentioned several times today as well, the need to reach second and third generation was also highlighted throughout the three consultations. In terms of partnerships, the importance of internal coordination was raised, uh, not only horizontal coordination between ministries and other agencies like uh, ele election management bodies, but also what we call vertical coordination between national and local levels. And of course, uh, the cooperation between countries, especially countries of origin and destination, was highlighted several times across the three consultations but also um, the importance of other actors, as Martin Kingsley rightfully pointed out, such as academia, civil society, and private sector, especially through chambers of commerce. So this is just a quick overview of that process of development. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roberto. It was incredible. Can, can I quickly ask you something? Did anything surprise you in the sense of the consultations? I have to say that the consistency of the issues, you know, I mean, we're talking about the regional consultations, but as I mentioned, in the case of Eurasia and the Pacific, we're talking about almost half the globe. And really, what we found is you know, the issues really came up all the time and time again were those same points that I mentioned there. Um, no matter where we were talking about, you know, whether we're talking about you know, the, the Pacific Islands or the Caribbean or you know, South America or Central Asia, same issues kept coming up about you know, data, about building trust, about uh, making sure that policies are addressing the needs and aspirations of the members of diaspora. Incredible. Thank you, Roberto. 
And I think what we get a sense, I just want to reflect on a question in the, in the chat as well. It was for Kingsley, but I'll jump in Kingsley if it's, okay, if it's okay with you. In a sense of what do we regard as a successful diaspora engagement initiative or process? And I think one of the key skills in diaspora engagement is listening. And I think what we try to do, achieve through the, the, the process to develop the outcome document is that active listening process. You know, I think it's something that we can do much more of as well in terms of the lens of diaspora diplomacy. So the good news is, is that having done all the work, and this is the, the researcher in me in many ways, we've identified the problem, we've set the context, and, and now it's about trying to understand how do we put something together to help us achieve this and address those issues together. But not just address the issues, but to explore and accelerate the opportunities. On that note, I would like to thank everybody for their participation, their input, particularly in the early processes to get the document to where it is. Most importantly, enjoy the rest of your time in Dublin. You may find Kingsley and myself walking around the streets saying the word diaspora. We're kind of known, we're kind of known for doing it. <laughs> but on that note, I'll maybe hand back to our, to our moderator and, and uh, facilitators, and we can take it from there. Thank you.